It's late afternoon on a warm winter day in 1978, and South Korean actress Choi Eun-hee is walking along a secluded beach in Hong Kong. Forty feet away, a woman she knows stands on the shore, motioning her to come over. A few strong-looking men stand by her side. Choi feels uneasy, like something bad is about to happen. And she's right. She's been lured here. As Choi walks over to the woman, a speedboat filled with more strong-looking men pulls up to the shore. The men watch as Choi approaches, and when she gets near, they nod at each other. They grab her, and they force her into the boat. Their destination? North Korea. Choi was kidnapped to be forced to star in movies for the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-il. This is a story about film and cinema in the scariest country on Earth. But really, this is about a storyteller, Kim Jong-il, the second leader of North Korea, a man who could change the weather with his mood, and who invented the hamburger in the year 2000, even though it had already been invented. And one thing about Jong-il is that he loved movies. He used the art and craft of cinema not only as a tool to indulge his own creative dreams, but also as a way to drill his propaganda into the minds of millions of North Koreans to hold on to power, cementing him and his family as the powerful leaders of North Korea. Hey, before we go on, did you know that there is a market of people and companies that do everything in their power to know more about you, about your birthday, about your address, about your online activity, about your preferences, so that they can take that and sell it on an open market to corporations that want to market to you. I hate that. It's gotten so out of control. My email inbox is a mess. My phone is always ringing and it's most of the time it's robots. I am done with this. Luckily, there exists a solution and that solution happens to be the sponsor of today's video. Thank you, Incogni. Incogni is a service that takes you off of these lists, which is not an easy thing. And actually a few years ago, I tried to unsubscribe myself. Like I tried to go through this process and I actually failed. Like I could not do it. Luckily, Incogni exists. So the way it works is you sign up and you give Incogni permission to reach out to data brokers on your behalf to exercise your rights to not be on these lists. Like you, we all have a right to do this, but the process is so complicated. The, the number of data brokers is so great that none of us will actually unsubscribe from these lists. Incogni deletes personal information from dozens of data brokers. I've been on Incogni monitoring the progress and I am very pleased with what I am seeing. I'm getting taken off these lists left and right. I am on my journey to be rid of all of this spam. And that is a very satisfying reality. So you can get this at a massive discount, at least if you click the link in my description, which is incogni.com slash Johnny Harris. You can go sign up and get 60% off Incogni. Get a huge discount and start your journey of getting rid of your personal information from all of these marketplaces. What you're paying for is privacy. Incogni is here to help protect us from what has become a very malicious industry of data brokers. Thank you, Incogni, for existing and for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to Kim Jong-il and all of his wild shenanigans. We watched as many North Korean films as we could get our hands on to make this video. And let me tell you, this is a world of cinema unlike anything you've ever seen. It's one full of farmer revolutions and extreme nationalism and women frequently sacrificing their lives, as well as a lot of music, spontaneous odes to the great leader and some really colorful operas. <laughs> So I want to let you into this world and show you how this happened, how this one man's obsession drove him to literally kidnap people in the name of making movies. Movies that he used to brainwash his people, but also movies that he hoped would help fulfill his dream of turning North Korea into a center of world-class cinema. Up near the misty volcano of Mount Pektu, 
in a modest log cabin enshrouded in dense, snow-capped forest, the great leader opened his eyes for the very first time. The thunderous rain stilled, the dark clouds parted, and through them, a glimmering double rainbow emerged, arching its way across the muted morning sky. And a bright new star appeared overhead, making its debut in the open heavens. The shining star of Pektu had arrived. Well, at least that's the story that most North Koreans were told. In reality, the year was actually 1941, likely at some Soviet military base in Russia. There probably weren't any rainbows or new stars created. It's probably just a normal day. Oh, and his given name wasn't even Kim Jong-il. It was Yuri Ilsenovich Kim, right? That's like a total Russian name. As an adult, he rewrote his backstory again and again over the course of like 20 years. And this is our first big clue about Kim Jong-il, the second leader of North Korea. He was a storyteller. The legend goes that when he was seven years old, he was watching this North Korean film called My Home Village. He was with his parents. And after the movie, this seven-year-old Jong Il marched up to one of the filmmakers and told him that the winter scene in the movie didn't feel lifelike because the falling snow wasn't actually collecting on the character's head, like it didn't look natural. And instead it looked like what it actually was, which was cotton balls. Totally low budget and unacceptable. The filmmakers were so ashamed that they reshot the scene without the falling snow and re-released the film. Jong Il's obsession with movies grew over time till he eventually collected 20,000 bootlegged VHS and DVDs that were stored in an air-conditioned library manned with 250 full-time employees. Like this guy was serious about his movies and he would watch these movies like all the time. Everything from Hollywood Westerns to classics like Friday the 13th and Rambo to Japanese monster movies like Godzilla. He was a big fan of American stars like Elizabeth Taylor and he apparently loved Daffy Duck and the James Bond franchise. Well, that is until a Bond film came out where North Korean leaders were like the enemies. He was actually pretty insulted with that one. But this guy was a full-blown cinephile. Like he watched so many movies that his dad, Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea, was actually pretty concerned that his obsession had become unhealthy. But soon, Kim Jong-il's dictator dad would find a way to use his son's obsession to stay in power. Okay, so this story's kind of nuts. It's 1967. North Korea is still kind of a newish country, like a couple decades old. Kim Jong-il's dad is still the leader dictator who's running the country, has all the power. But he's got competition from other powerful people within the party that want him to step aside and make way for a new leader. These men want to steer North Korea in a new direction by choosing their own successor to him. And this competing faction starts to use film as a tool to get the people of North Korea on board. They make a movie celebrating the life of this aspiring successor, trying to lay a groundwork for a new cult of personality around this guy, not Kim Il-sung. Big mistake. Kim Il-sung is not gonna let this happen. He goes straight to his film studio in the capital, Pyongyang and he gives a speech. He warns the whole film department that someone in the party is trying to glorify themselves, which is super not communist. And they're using film to do it. So Kim says to all of his filmmakers, we need to step up our game in securing power through film. And then he asks if anyone has the courage to guide the film studio correctly, meaning to make more effective propaganda that will keep Kim Il-sung and his family in power. Oh, and look who's in the room. Film buff and son of the dictator, Kim Jong-il, the shining star. He's watching quietly in the back of the room. And then he speaks up, saying that he would nobly volunteer to be the head of the film studio, to help level up North Korean cinema, to help hold on to power. Something must have clicked for Kim Il-sung at that moment. His son, who was not a promising candidate for his successor, he was helplessly obsessed with movies. But here he is, stepping up, finally passionate about politics. Because politics and film are now kind of the same thing. It was clear that if there was any position that he would fit into, this was it. So he promotes his son on the spot to lead the propaganda and agitation department, the department in charge of all movies, plays, and publishing within North Korea, retelling this story of North Korea to its people, reframing it as something glorious, keeping the people indoctrinated to the version of reality that keeps the Kims in power, and using film to do it. The struggle for the future of North Korea was happening on the silver screen, and now Jong Il had his hand on the dial, in control of what he called this powerful ideological weapon.
Getting into the mind of an artist can be hard. But in this case, not really. If there's one thing Kim Jong-il liked to do, it was to talk about his thoughts on cinema. He wrote an entire book about it, which was kind of the impetus of this entire video. This book. On the Art of Cinema by Kim Jong-il. When I was hanging out at the North Korean border last year, I had this book with me. And I would like, read it in between stops. And it's actually kind of good, or at least parts of it. Like a lot of it's like garbage, but like there are parts that actually like, I was like, oh yeah, you got this. Like this is basically the holy Bible of North Korean filmmaking. And it dictates how movies in the country should be made. I mean, the book spends a lot of time making it crystal clear that filmmakers are an extension of the government and they are charged with the noble task of leading the ideological revolution via storytelling devoting their artistic skill to the party's endeavor to build socialism and communism. In other words, filmmakers' job is to make clever propaganda for its people. This isn't unique to North Korea. Since the invention of the motion picture, governments of all kinds have used the power of cinema to tell their story in their way, often sugar-coated, often inaccurate to the facts. But I'm telling you, North Korean cinema has its own weird, wild flavor. This is the great age of Chuche. Chuche is the foundational ideology of North Korea. It has its foundation in Marxist communism, like from the Soviet Union, but it has an obsessive focus on isolation and self-reliance, and it glorifies independence from outsiders. In this book, Kim Jong-il makes it very clear that to make a successful North Korean film, that characters should, quote, live, work, and struggle with the conviction that they are masters of the revolution and the work of socialist construction. A lot of clunky language here. I'm not sure if it's just a bad translation or if Kim Jong-il is just a really writer. Anyway, it goes on to say that the characters in these films should accept the full responsibility of solving their own problems without any outside help. You can see this obsession with self-reliance in this movie called Myself in the Distant Future. There's a scene where this tractor is like plowing a field and it breaks down. But it's not a problem for these good communist farmers. Look what happens next. They step up, they pull out their sickles, and they harvest the rest of the field by hand with smiles on their faces. They don't need outsider technology from the big city to make their lives easier. They're self-reliant. Oh, and right before this scene, all of these farmers had just broken out into spontaneous poetry chanting about dedicating their lives to North Korea. During this like poetic chanting, there's just like shots of Mount Pektu. Really nice B-roll. Not because it has anything to do with the story, but just so we remember that like Mount Pektu is like super important. Because that's where Kim Jong-il was born. But he, he really wasn't born there. <laughs> <laughs> Another big theme is struggle. In the book, he quotes his beloved father, Kim Il-sung, quote, the life of a revolutionary begins with struggle and ends with struggle. This is really good propaganda because you've got juche and struggle as like the foundational ingredients. You start to see stories that glorify and give meaning to North Korean suffering. Like this 1989 film called The Broad Bell Flower. It's sort of a love story where like this woman's lover like gets exiled from the town. And there's this tension on whether or not she should leave her hometown for a different life. And then the father of the main character comments very wisely that it's actually better to stay and struggle to find happiness, like glorifying the struggle. And in case it didn't come through the first time, near the end of the movie, the main character finds out that her lover is trying to come back to the hometown that he deserted, and she's confirmed on how right her father was. Struggle is the only way to achieve happiness. <laughs> So now all over North Korea, you have starving people cut off from the world economy because of their despotic leader watching these movies. Stories about how it's actually the most noble way to live, the key to happiness, the noble ideals of self-reliance. The regime made sure that everyone saw these films. Way out in the countryside, in factories, farms, army units. And all of this helped North Korean citizens reframe their country's reckless dictatorship into a protector 
of an eternal revolution that must continue to fight against outside evil. There's a whole chapter in this book that Kim Jong-il writes to screenwriters. He tells them to think of their stories as seeds. Again, this is actually like pretty profound, if not applied to propaganda. He tells these screenwriters that they need to, quote, equip themselves with the ideology of the party. Translation, choose stories that will stick in people's minds, that will grow, that will turn these people's suffering into fuel for North Korean nationalism and pride. Pride in the country that's causing the suffering in the first place. There's one movie where this football player trains ridiculously hard, all in the name of, quote, achieving the teachings of the fatherly leader, Kim Il-sung, to turn North Korea into a kingdom of sports. He ends up training ridiculously, like way harder than, and everyone's like, dude, you're crazy. You're like training too hard. And he's like, no, I have to do this to glorify my country. These nationalistic pump-up movies pair nicely with films that rewrite the story of North Korea, the history. The story of Japanese occupation of the Korean Peninsula, which was indeed brutal and deserves to be told accurately because it was bad enough. But these movies just like so overly caricature it, glorifying the revolution against capitalists and landlords or showing these caricatured battle scenes where the Koreans defeat the Japanese in a good old flying martial arts scene. And while these ideologies and these messages are kind of baked into the story, oftentimes they're just sort of shoehorned in in the form of like a music break where these characters just sort of randomly burst into songs about how their struggle is good for the future of their country. These unwarranted music moments are everywhere in North Korean films. In this chapter, he says that these films must have music that has revolutionary passion, that moves people to strive to defend what is new and noble. He says that songs should be short, simple, easy to understand, and to sing. Infectious, catchy, so that people will sing along and get it stuck in their head. Okay, so in watching all of these movies, we were surprised that these films give a surprisingly significant role to women. So this is actually a feature of a lot of communist propaganda, which sees traditional female roles as in line with the ideals of like a model communist comrade. Submissive, identities being determined by their relationship to the family, to their communities, in this case, and most importantly, to the state community-minded submission. Stalin actually used the same trick back in the 30s, creating art that appealed to, quote, the feminine identification and submission. So you see this in North Korean films, like in this film, Girls From My Hometown, where the main character is this country girl who shows her dedication to her country by pledging to take care of her husband, who's newly blinded after coming back from a war, as an act of sacrifice for her country. <laughs> In this film called The Name Given by the Era, the main character gives up going to college to lead a construction and take on the grueling task of building a dam. Why? Because hard work and struggle benefit the country, and that is the most important thing in all of these stories. But by female sacrifice, we can literally mean like sacrificing their lives. Like in this film, where this woman risks her life in the midst of like this storm mudslide chaos scene, all in the name of saving these sheep that were sent to her community by the government. <laughs> Oh, 
Or in this film, Song of Retrospection, where the main character uses grenades to blow herself up so that she can destroy the oncoming South Korean enemies to save the rest of her squad. <laughs> Using all these principles, Kim Jong-il ran the film studio. He created dozens of films that were his best shot at telling good stories, but really mostly propaganda for his family's political agenda to keep control over his people. And it worked. Kim Jong-il's dad stayed in power. The people stayed subservient and indoctrinated to this fantasy of eternal revolution and the glorification of struggle. And Jong-il got to make movies. But despite all of this success, there was still one major problem. The film still kind of sucked. And Jong Il, the guy with a collection of 20,000 movies that he watched all the time, kind of knew that they sucked. I mean, of course they sucked. His filmmakers weren't allowed to watch foreign movies. Oh, not to mention that they weren't even allowed to leave the country. So yeah, these films were kind of just in an echo chamber of predictable characters, lackluster cinematography, and the same plots over and over with a bunch of shoehorned like poetry and opera like music breaks. They weren't good and Jong Il knew it. His solution? Steal people from the outside who could make his films better. So it's the 1970s and Choi Eun-hee is one of South Korea's most popular actresses. She had been married to this South Korean director, Shin Seng Ok, and they had recently divorced. But up north, Kim Jong-il is looking at these two as the potential solution to his problem. So he has his men go to Hong Kong and pose as businessmen, apparently interested in starting a production company with Choi. They lure her to Hong Kong for a meeting. And this is how she got grabbed off a beach at Repulse Bay. She gets sedated, thrown into the boat, and they take her back to North Korea, where they put her in a government building in Pyongyang. A few weeks later, her ex-husband, the director, Shin, goes to Hong Kong to look for her. He's in his car, and suddenly the car in front of him stops, blocking the road and forcing him to stop. A few men get out of the car, come back and open Shin's door, and put a nylon bag over his head. They tie a rope around his ankles, and they take him into their car. He too is now on his way to North Korea. Kim Jong-il greets Shin when he arrives to Pyongyang, and he explains what he's up to. He wants him and his actress ex-wife to make him propaganda movies, but Shin refuses. So Jong-il sends him to a labor camp for five years. Okay, so fast forward to 1983. Kim Jong-il decides that the two are finally enlightened, whatever that means, and he throws them a party and tells them that yes, they're still prisoners, but they can make whatever movie they want. He even apparently like apologized and shifted the blame of like the whole labor camp thing to like other officials and said that he was too busy to notice how poorly they were being treated. Like this guy sounds literally insane. They don't really have much choice here, so they get to work. And over the course of their years in captivity, they made six movies for their captor. One of the films that Shin directed became a classic. And this is the film I'm like most excited to show you. This is Pulgasari. This film seems to be a ripoff of a 1962 South Korean film called Bulgasari, which was largely inspired by the Japanese hit Godzilla. We all know Godzilla. We'll never actually know because the Bulgasari South Korean film was apparently lost soon after it was released. Anyway, the point is Kim Jong-il wanted a monster movie. He wanted this to be so good that he even broke his rule of not letting outsiders come in to work on his movies. So in addition to the stolen director that he had already kidnapped, he started recruiting the people who worked on The Return of Godzilla a year earlier over in Japan, including the actual guy who was in the Godzilla suit as well as the man who led the special effects. Like he had like the dream team. Oh, and of course to get them there, he lied. According to the guy who played Godzilla, he and his crew were told that they were heading to China for a shoot and instead found themselves in North Korea. Okay, so now Jong Il's lifelong movie fantasies are in reach. Maybe, just maybe North Korea could make like an international blockbuster. He's got his kidnapped director and all these technicians to make his monster movie great.
Yeah, no, this didn't work out. Kim Jong-il was still overseeing the whole thing, so the film still was like full-blown propaganda, employing all of the North Korean cinematic tricks that Jong-il laid out in his book. So of course you've got the requisite Juche self-reliance scene showing the villagers getting water from a well and farming. Gotta show that. You've got the overarching plot that outside help, AKA Polgasari, does more harm than good. More on that in a second. And then there's the requisite female sacrifice when this blacksmith's daughter hides inside of a bell so that Polgasari, who eats metal, will eat the bell and simultaneously eat her. And if she dies, then Polgasari dies too because they like formed this like blood bond in the beginning of the movie. It's a whole thing. Anyway, Polgasari himself is said to be a manifestation of capitalism in society. The farmers love him at first because he helps overthrow the king, all in the name of promising these people individual freedom. But then they find that they've created a monster who needs to feed on steel and iron to grow more and more powerful, and it gets out of control. So the farmers just keep feeding him and feeding him with all their farming tools, but then they have no way to sustain themselves, so the only thing they can do is stop the beast from growing, which means killing him, meaning revolution. But, and this is where it gets really juicy, there's another way to interpret the film. Remember who's directing it? This kidnapped South Korean director. Some speculate that the director used the film to create an analogy for the tragedy of North Korea, where Kim Il-sung, who at first was helping liberate his people from oppression and occupation, turned power hungry, ended up starving the people demanding their resources, using the revolution to feed only himself. Shin, the director, later said that the film was an anti-war, anti-authoritarian theme. So take it however you like. I mean, this film's wild. But in Kim Jong-il's eyes, this was a massive success. And Kim Jong-il was feeling good and he let up a bit on Shin and Choi, allowing them to travel to Vienna for a film festival where they could maybe meet a financing partner who could bankroll a new project, a North Korean film on Genghis Khan. But of course, when they got to Vienna, they found their way to the US embassy and got asylum in the United States. Of course, Kim Jong-il was enraged when he found out about this. He actually went back and took Shin's name off of all the films that he had directed and ordered a nationwide mandate to discredit him. He called Shin a traitor and his name has become unmentionable without punishment in North Korea. So yeah, that is the bonkers story of North Korean cinema. In 1994, Jong Il's dad died, and he eventually rose as the new supreme leader of North Korea. His love for movies continued to influence the form of North Korean propaganda. And they even started an international film festival in Pyongyang. And the only people on the invite list were like all the countries that North Korea vibed with. Like Iran, Egypt, India, Vietnam, and China. Oh, but this wasn't just during the Cold War. The festival was still going up until the pandemic a few years ago. It's one of the few North Korean functions that actively seeks connection to the outside world. Kim Jong-il died in 2011, but his legacy in North Korean cinema remains super strong. One of the most recent films that we know about came out in 2016, and it's the same old ingredients. Female sacrifice, extreme nationalism, unwarranted praise for the current leader, Kim Jong-un, and of course, no shortage of spontaneous song breaks. Hey everyone, hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was kind of long and in-depth, um, but boy, we could not stop ourselves. There was too much here, and there's so much more that we couldn't include. One of my favorite kind of video lately is where we go super deep into like some niche that I would never think to go deep into, but you start to pull on a thread and you just can't get enough, and that's what happened in this case. So I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me show you something, hold on. I made a poster, look. I've never made a poster before. I finally made a poster. It's one I've been wanting to make for a very long time. It's called All Maps Are Wrong. Because they are. All maps are wrong, in a sense. Um, 
we're trying to, you know, take the spherical earth and put it on a flat piece of paper. And to do that, we have to stretch it in all these weird ways. And this map kind of celebrates that and reminds us of it and turns it into kind of art. But it's like smart art. Yeah, smart art, we'll call it. The fact is, uh, this is a way that you can support our channel if you're interested in that and also get this wonderful poster. You can see the link in the description um, for where to go find this poster. The newsroom is our Patreon community where we publish an extra video every month too. Um, you also get access to a bunch of other perks that you can check out over at patreon.com slash Johnny Harris. LUTs and presets is what we use to color our videos and photos. Uh, this helps us make our photos and videos look more beautiful. I started a travel company a few years ago. It's called Bright Trip, and it is a place where you go to get smarter about traveling and to travel in a smarter way. And that's basically it for me uh, of all the things I have going on that I wanted to tell you about. Um, thanks for being here and for supporting the work that we do just by being here and commenting and being a part of this discussion. I really value this community and excited to keep making stuff. See you in the next one.